Good day. I am now presenting to you my working dissertation entitled The Passage of Republic Act 1425, Contextualizing Rizal, Nationalism, and La Leyenda Negra, Its Unintended Consequences. This study attempts to write a historical narrative on the enactment of the Republic Act 1425, popularly known as the Rizal Law, which obliges the study of Rizal's life and works, notably the No Limitangere and El Filibusterismo in colleges and universities. The researcher used the historical method, the descriptive, narrative, analytic method, with the theoretical framework of Karl Popper's unintended consequences, which explains that human action or intention might be good and beneficial for man but may have an unintentional outcomes from the original conception of the action. The study investigated the nationalism of the original proponent of the law, Claro Embrecto, and his agenda on putting the name of Rizal and his works, particularly the two novels, in adopting a solution to the sense of nationalism of the Filipinos in the 1950s. The researcher also discussed if studying Rizal's life, works, and writings would promote Filipino nationalism that would serve as a tool for addressing the post-war problems of the country. This research, therefore, has analyzed Rizal's concept of nationalism set against the backdrop of Philippine contemporary life, where nationalism, as Recto observed, was most wanted. This would serve the engine that would start economic development for the country, a most logical necessity then and today. Apropos, this study proves that although Republic Act 1425 intends to teach the future generation about Filipino nationalism using Rizal's life, works, and writings, it departs from the original content of instilling nationalism, but in effect, resurrects La Leyenda Negra or Black Legend that up to now puts the Spanish period in a bad light long after it's gone. May I now present to you the sub-problems that will be divided as chapters of this work. The first sub-problem is, what is Recto's concept of nationalism and why did he espouse its learning by the students? When it comes to Recto's nationalism, it can be attributed in general as the assertion of the independence granted to the Filipino people. For him, the Filipinos must fully assert its political independence for it to enjoy the blessings of a truly independent nation. The colonization as his political biographer Renato Constantino states, is the essence of a true Filipino nation. This brings us to why Recto wanted to espouse the learning of nationalism because he wished the youth to defend the country as the United States continuously doing its intervention to the political, economic, social, and military aspects of the Philippine state. Thus, in 1956, he proposed a bill in the Senate classified as Senate Bill No. 438. It also had its counterpart in the House of Representatives called House Bill No. 5561. For Recto, studying the life and works of Rizal, especially the reading of Noli Metangere and El Filibusterismo, will empower the youth to bring out the spirit of nationalism and defend the country from any form of control and invasion from a foreign power. However, as Recto tried to make Rizal as his model to revive the sense of Filipino nationalism, it can be observed that the ideology and nationalism espoused by Rizal is different from the one that conceptualized by Recto. This will be discussed further in the next chapters of this study. Now, for the second sub-problem, how was the Rizal law expected to bring about the understanding of nationalism? Recto chose Rizal because, for him, there is a need for a rededication to the ideals of freedom and nationalism for which the life of Rizal and his contributions fit for it. For Recto, Rizal and other heroes in our history shape our national character. He believed as well that a careful reading of Rizal's novels could be the inspiring source of the youth in bringing out the love for the country among themselves. In the debates of Rizal Bill, the exchanges were heated between the pro and anti in the bill. The Catholic organizations, the faithful, and the Catholic hierarchy opposed the bill vehemently. Groups such as Catholic Action of the Philippines, the Congregation of the Mission of the Knights of Columbus, Catholic Teachers Guild, organized opposition to the bill. They were countered by the Veteranos de la Revolución, the spirit of 1896, Alagad de Rizal, the Freemasons, and the Knights of Rizal. Others who opposed the bill were Francisco Soc Rodrigo, Mariano Jesus Cuenco, and Decoroso Rosales. Now, for these photos, the first one here, as it reads in the caption, Senator Claro M. Recto making his preliminary speech on the Rizal bill on the floor of the Senate as a rabid opponent's measure. Senator Rodrigo on the left and Senator Cuenco on the right are all attention. 
The Batangas senator will continue his speech probably tomorrow when he will bolster his talk with documentary evidence. And this, this photo came from Manila Times published on April 26, 1956, page 2. Now from the collections of the uh, speeches of Recto compiled by Isagani Medina, this is the, uh, the photo of the copy of Recto's open letter to Archbishop Rufino J. Santos entitled The Vision of a Prelate, an open letter to the Archbishop of Manila written under the spoof of Rizal's La Vision de Fray Rodriguez. And the last photo here below, as it reads in the caption, To read or not to read, Mrs. Nieves Pains del Rosario, President of the Panitig ng Kababaihan and the Ranking Official of the Labor Department, was one of those who spoke yesterday in favor of the Laurel Bill that would make results Noli and Fili compulsory reading. Yesterday was the second day of the Senate hearing on the controversial proposal. Catholic elements who opposed the bill spoke their piece the other day. And this photo was also taken from the Manila Times, dated April 21, 1956, page 11. Now for the next one, the first photo here, as it reads in the caption, Youth Rally for Rizal Bill. Leaders of the National Youth Movement for Rizal signed last night a rally on Plaza Miranda against certain churchmen who opposed the Rizal Bill providing for the compulsory reading of the hero's novels. The youth leaders spoke from a truck borrowed from a sympathizer. The photo above here is a Madok Yu In Song, business manager, tearing the copies of the pastoral letter of the Catholic hierarchy, while the other one is Isabella Moran Jr., president of the movement for STEM. Shown below of this photo is part of the crowd that attended the rally, and this was also taken from the Manila Times dated May 8, 1956. On the second photo here, as it reads in the caption, the Archdiocesan Catholic Action of Manila held a symposium yesterday expressing opposition to the Rizal Bill. The inset photo shows here Father Jesus Cavana CM. One of the speakers were Attorney Ernesto Esquilar, President of the Archdiocesan Catholic Action, Dr. Antonio Molina, Attorney Narciso Pimentel Jr. of the Catholic Speakers and Writers Bureau, Dr. Jose Maria Hernandez, President of the Catholic Action of the Philippines, and Attorney Tutoma Rojas, President of the Holy Name Society. And this was also taken from the Manila Times, dated May 3, 1956, front page. On the last photo here was the declaration of the Legion of Mary of the Philippines in support of the pastoral letter issued by the Catholic Church and opposing the passage of the Rizal Bill. And this photo was also taken from the Manila Times, published on May 3, 1956, page 2. From the second photo on the symposium, Father Jesus Cavana argued that the novels belong to the past and that teaching them would represent the current conditions of the country. He said that out of 333 pages of the Noli Mitangere, only 25 contained patriotic passages, while 120 contained anti-Catholic statements. On the other hand, the Archbishop of Manila, Rufino Santos, protested in a pastoral letter that Catholic students would be affected if the compulsory reading of the unexpurgated version was pushed through. Arsenio Lacson, Manila's mayor who supported the bill, walked out of Mass when the priest read a circular from the Archbishop denouncing the bill. Outside the Senate, the Catholic schools threatened to close down if the bill was passed. Recto countered that if that happened, the schools would be nationalized. Recto did not believe the threat, stating that the schools were too profitable to be closed. The schools gave up the threat but threatened to punish legislators in favor of the law in future elections. A compromise was suggested to use expurgated version. Recto, who had supported the required reading of the unexpurgated version, declared the people who would eliminate the books of Rizal from the schools would blot out from our minds the memory of the national hero. This is not a fight against Recto but a fight against Rizal adding that since Rizal is dead, they are attempting to suppress his memory. Thus, on May 12, 1956, a compromise inserted by the Committee on Education Chairman Laurel that accommodated the objections of the Catholic Church was approved unanimously. 
the bill specified that only college and university students would have the option of reading unexpurgated versions of clerically contested reading material such as Noli Metanghere and El Filibusterismo. The bill was enacted on June 12, 1956 that at that time, uh, Flag Day celebration of the Philippines and today's Independence Day. Now, for the third sub-problem, how would the study of the life and works, specific, specifically the Noli and Fili, bring about an understanding of nationalism? The researcher was able to study and analyze three major works of Rizal, particularly his novels, The Noli Metangere and El Filibusterismo. This also includes the political writings of Rizal, such as Sobre la Indolencia de los Filipinos, Filipinas dentro de años, Amor Patrio, La Verdad para Todos, and others. In the novels, it can be said that this is Rizal's critique of the cultural values of the Filipinos in his time, with an implied analysis of social systems and prophetic vision. Rizal was very effective in portraying the Philippine society. Thus, the researcher calls him the social portraitist. This novel can be attributed to contain his version of the philosophy of history because he used these works in propelling his desire for an advanced society and culture by using the institutions, even if in conflict with one another, from which progress may be possible. In his political writings, Rizal is still consistent in choosing liberty through reforms and not on revolution through armed struggle. His nationalism is seen through assimilation of the Philippines to Spain, with features of a humanistic approach as expresses in his novels. Now, given these points, the researcher now went to its initial findings that the Rizal law created an unintended consequence by becoming a way to put Spain in the Philippines in the bad light. Recto in Rizal law intended to instill nationalism to the students through mandatory study of the life, works, and writings of Rizal. Thus, the unintended consequence of the intended action of Rizal law is the La Leyenda Negra against Spain by which Spaniards representing all the forces of repression, brutality, intellectual and artistic backwardness, religious, and political intolerance. According to Agoncillo, there was an anti-clerical statement in the 19th century. One could sense that this anti-clerical sentiment extended to the 1950s during the deliberations of Rizal Law. The novels presented a bleak picture of the conditions of the Philippines, exposed inadequacies of the colonial government and inanities of the friars. They wielded tremendous power and influence at the time. So the question is, did the students become nationalistic after reading the novels and other works of Rizal? What then was the intent of Rizal in writing the novels? The common view is to arouse nationalism of the youth, but they were written in Spanish language. So how could the natives read these works when they were not even well-versed in the Spanish language? Rizal wrote the novels to expose the inhumanity of the Spaniards. To whom? Not to the natives because what could they do when they were under the authority of the Spaniards? Of course, it is addressed to the Spaniards, hoping they could institute reforms in the colonial administration. And now, it is clear to say that the ideology and nationalism of Rizal are not equal to the nationalism that Recto wanted to promote in the 1950s. In the writings of Rizal, from the novels No Limitangre and El Filibusterismo, as well as his political writings, he merely asked for reforms after exposing the social cancer that infected the country, and in calling for it, he never advocated independence, which, in Recto's mind, we must fully assert to be able to enjoy the blessings of a truly independent nation. And that would be all for this presentation. This study now consists about 70 to 75% of the entire research. And now, here is the list of my updated bibliography for this study. So, I have here the primary sources, speeches, the primary sources, of course, the proceedings. We have the proceedings from the Congress and the Senate. And I have this compiled work by, by Isigani Medina and Merla Feliciano, the complete works of Claro M. Recto. We have also prime sources coming from the newspapers. Some of them were only titles without the author. And some, we have authors. Another list of newspapers. 
We have Amante Bergogna here and Jesus Bergogna. Okay. Writers from the Manila Bulletin. Okay. The, the Bergogna uh, articles. And then we have also here another collection from the newspapers. Titles. Published in the Sentinel, Manila Times, Manila Bulletin. Another collection from the newspapers. From the Manila Bulletin and Manila Times. And we have here articles from Jose Guevara, all in the Manila Times. And uh, it was joined later by Manuel Salak Jr., also published in the Manila Times. And then we have here publications, uh, titles only without the authors, published in the Sentinel. Also here from the Manila Bulletin, and Sentinel. And then we have Mrs. Paredes Jr. for the Sentinel. Okay. Others coming from Recto himself. Okay. And we have also uh, from Representative Cuenco's Pleas for Religious Liberty, title only, but no author, published in the Sentinel. And then we have also article from Francisco Soc Rodrigo, Manuel Salak Jr., Okay. Most coming from the Manila Times. Okay. And then, we have also here uh, the uh, articles or article coming from Rufino J. Santos, the Archbishop of Manila at the time. Okay. So, other titles published in Bulletin and Sentinel. Okay. And I have also here updated collection of secondary sources used in this study. In this slide, it's all a Goncillo. Okay. Uh, I have some few from uh, Agoncillo here, another one. And then we have uh, Benedict Anderson, Constantino, okay. Filomeno Aguilar, okay. Daroy, Father de la Costa. Marcelino Foronda, Bonifacio Gallego, Carlin Howe, Reynaldo Eleto, Alejandro Lichauco. And of course, the collections coming from the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, where I got the, uh, the translation of Jose Rizal's events in the Philippine Islands, okay, as well as the letters of Rizal to his family members, okay, such poems, and political and historical writings. Okay. We have also Nawara, Pascual, Resurrection, and the translations of Nolime Tanghere and El Filibus Turismo by Charles Derby Shire. Epiphany San Juan, Dennis Roth, Father Schumacher. Okay. Also the book of uh, Gregory Saide is here. Now the journals we have here from the Historical Bulletin, the Philippine Studies. Okay. We have also uh, the Budhi. The Journal of Asian Studies also, and uh, we have here the uh, the No Limit Angle Century After an uh, Interdisciplinary Perspective. That's part of the Budhi Papers. Petro Nilo Dalis, The Ideas of European Liberalism, The Fiction of Rizal, Manuel de Jos, Father de la Costa, Teba de Ocampo, Pacifico de Mandan Sr., and uh, Manuel D., Fabella, Fabella, Ricardo Garcia, of course, Flor Florentino Hornedo, then Laurel, Jose Laurel Jr., Sotel Laurel, and then we have also Camilo Osillas, Antonio Molina, Ricardo Pascual, on his article, Institutional Interpretation of Rizal's Novels, and then we have Carlos Quirino, Saludonio Resurrección, Jose Romero, Roberto Romualdez, okay. And uh, Father Schumacher, Serrano, Rosales, all of this coming from the historical book team. And then uh, Lorenzo Sumulo, Stephen Totanes, Chad Vernon, Manuel Yap, Nicolas Safra, and Gregorio Saide. And that would be all. Thank you very much and God bless us all.